this evening we're delighted to have Ziggy, we call him Rogoff. What a wonderful name. We must explore that. Ziggy Rogoff. Um, and I think it's the first time we've had somebody with quite the heritage that uh, Ziggy's got. But Ziggy, it's great to have you. Welcome. Um, where did that name come from? Well, struck by the fact you make me sound like royalty, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Why not? <laughs> no, Rogoff. Um, <clears throat> Rogoff actually... <clears throat> is we named after my, it comes from my great grandfather who was Wolf Rogov. So this would come from, from the Yiddish, from Zev. See, he came from Russia, but we don't know where he came from Russia, but we did find out recently that he is buried in France because he died in the first world war fighting for Britain. And huh. originally his surname was Rogalek. Huh. Yeah, so there's so there's something more more research we can do. <laughs> now, what's what, what's your um, what's your what, what do you do for a living these days? But I want to go back to your heritage. But just yeah. to find out a little bit about you, what do you do for a living? I work for a, a Jewish mission organisation. We're, we're a Jewish group of people who believe in Jesus, and we share the gospel with Jewish people and and everybody. So it's not just Jewish people, and we're called Jews for Jesus because many years ago there was a journalist in America who noticed that we're, there were Jewish people sharing the gospel and they wrote about us and said they are Jews for Jesus. Huh. And we, we liked the name so much that we used it. You stuck with it. And before that, you were working in the city, I think, weren't you? Yeah, I used to work in the Mayfair uh, in Glencore and used to work for Deutsche Bank before then. Huh. So some years in finance. And you're married and you have a, a, a little son called Noah. What a wonderful uh, name. Exactly. And, and we have a little one on the way. Oh, congratulations. Well, look, if it's a boy, you have my permission to call him Roger. Okay. I've, got, I've got bad news for you. We've already chosen his name. Oh, right. Now let's go so back. You've got there first. I know. <laughs> What's your background, uh, Ziggy? You know, tell us a bit about your parents, your grandparents, etc. Yes, yeah, so we come from a Jewish family. I've got four Jewish grandparents. Um, none of them are alive now. Um, they all came, like for many, many Jewish people that you may know personally, they've all come from Eastern Europe. So my, um, I think of my, uh, if I start on my father's side, um, they actually left uh, what would be, what we call Moldova, Kishinev. They left Moldova in 1905 because of the pogroms. And the pogroms were awful events when Jewish people would be dragged onto the street and, and literally being murdered by their neighbors. And, uh, and of course, uh, without, you don't have to do much research, but Kishinev was known as the capital of anti-Semitism at the beginning of the 20th century. And Jewish people, they left. And so my grandparents, or my great-grandparents in that, this case, they came to England and then my grandmother was born here. Her husband, uh, he was a descendant of, uh, of, of Wolf Rogoff. And so that's where we get the, the surname from. But the other side of the, uh, the family, they, maybe that, I think we've always got to remember every single Jewish family has been touched by the Holocaust. They may not immediately have a name, the relatives that died, but they have relatives who did, who did die. But it's more pronounced on my mother's side. So on my mother's side, her grandmother is called, was called a Holocaust survivor. Not because she endured any concentration camp, but because she lost every single member of her family. And so she came from a, <clears throat> she came from a small town in Slovakia near the, near the Tatras mountains. Uh, would be a mixed Catholic Jewish community. And all 885 Jewish people were deported to Auschwitz. That was in about March, 1942. Wow. My grandmother had been sent, uh, we called her Bubba, it's Yiddish for grandmother. In 1939, the family sent her to England. And obviously they got the, what we consider the considerable sum of money, the illegal paperwork. She made that very difficult journey. She survived, but, but nobody else did. And then she ended up marrying my grandfather, um, Joseph, she was called Josephine and he was called Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was an, an older man, a Jewish man who'd, who'd come over from Poland years before for looking for work and he'd come over with his mother. So in this case, you know, people, Jewish people either move because they're being persecuted or because they need work. And uh, so he came over because of work. And then so she and then they married and had my, had my mother. But even though he came from Poland and he left there at the beginning or met, before the First World War, because he served in the First World War and he went to Palestine, as it was called then, to serve with the British Army. He left relatives behind and they would, of course, and Poland lost three million Jewish people. And he definitely would have lost vast numbers of family members. But we often don't think about that, that the horrific loss. 
Yeah. Um, when you were growing up, Ziggy, were you told stories of all that your parents and grandparents had been through? No, the funny thing is, I don't think they ever really did. Um, I think it's, it's just a realisation. I think as I came to believe in Jesus and I came to think about what being Jewish meant, I was really struck by the idea that the Holocaust was, was this ast astonishingly horrific wickedness that had befallen our people. And if I had now said I believed in God and I believed in Jesus, then did I have any answers for why, why there was such profound wickedness in the world? And I think at that point, I began to think much more about the family than ever before. Often, I think when people get really, really old, Roger, they start to take a real interest in their, in their you know, ancestry.com. That wasn't an address, by the way. And because they've got nothing else to do with their time apart from hold their <laughs> grandchildren. But, but I, I actually came to that realization younger because, I, because believing in Jesus made me think there is wicked in this world and evil has been done to us. And then I began to think about our family more. My grandmother, she only ever really, only rarely ever spoke about what happened. And that was when she might be interviewed because when she moved into an old age home towards the end, it was a Holocaust survivor's home and mm -hmm. they wanted to hear her story. And that, that's when we would hear something like that. She wouldn't talk about it, I think, I think for a lot of people who went through and experienced that kind of pain, they don't want to talk about it. And we just, did talk about it. Just one other thing about your ancestry. When they came to the UK, Ziggy, were they welcomed? Oh, I see what you're saying. So um, all Jewish people would end up settling in the East End of London, <laughs> typically, in the, in the in, because there were two waves. The, ritual, the, the first ones, the Sephardi Jews who came over from Holland, they would end up, end up, going through the poor parts of, of let's say, um, the East End and going off to Golders Green. It was like, this was in the end of the 19th century. But in my grandmother's case, yeah, she ended up having to work as a domestic servant for, for an English family. And there was, there was one particular morning um, when the family ins demanded, insisted that she cook bacon for the family. Uh, my grandmother was horrified and, you know, well, uh, the idea of cooking bacon was enough to wretch, make her wretch. And when she actually was doing it, so the family legend goes, she literally vomited on the bacon. <laughs> and she said, uh, she said to the family, I can't, I can't do this because I'm Jewish. And the family responded by saying they would make every single effort to have her deported. Huh. Remember, this is like, this is like April, 1939. Um, no, she, she ran away. She'd met people on the way on trains and who'd wanted to offer her help. And she made safe passage to, to the East end of London. Um, what an astonishing moment of survival against to experience such a oh, such a horror. Mm. Uh, um, but I, I, as I often say, I don't. From her perspective, she would have considered that they were a Christian family. Yeah. Be, because they were different to her. From her perspective, either you were like Jewish or or the, or them, mm. and they the, them were always considered to be the others. And the fact that she was now in this terrifying situation where they they were literally saying what she'd always been taught. Mm. Um, so she came she would have come to the wrong conclusion and she she held to that kind of prejudice all of her life now Ziggy we're, we're well accustomed with the anti-semitism that there is when you were growing up going to school etc we was it a devout Jewish family or secular Jewish family and did you did I don't know did you feel as though you were um, I don't know the odd and out in class or school no, we went to, it was a very, very Jewish school, even if that was like 40% oh. of the school was Jewish, we had a Jewish assembly that was very populated. Um, we, there was only, if there was any kind of like Jewish Gentile divide or Jewish Christian divide, it was, it was, it was gentle, it was friendly, it was mocking, it was, it was childlike. There was, there was no real no, okay. offence. Mm. And do, did you go regularly to the synagogue? Were you? Oh, you see, we uh, finish off the question. And my, my parents, they are bound by great traditions. And if you know anything about Jewish people, we're bound by traditions. And of course, that great film, Fiddle on the Roof. Yes, the tradition. But it's not just Jewish people who love their traditions, by the way. All people who are religious, if any faith system in the entire world, <laughs> they have their traditions. Mm. And um, and to a large part, these these traditions dominate Jewish life to the extent that. That for my family, God wasn't someone we spoke about. He wasn't someone we we honoured or loved. It's just that we were Jewish, and you provided you keep doing the things the Jewish people are supposed to do, the things you eat and don't eat, wear don't wear, the certain days you do and don't. Um, we were Jewish, and, and that that's what it what it's meant. And for lo like a lot of Jewish families, my fa my families, my parents are no different. Almost all of their friends belong within their Jewish circles. 
Mm. And that's just so very, very typical, certainly of their generation, maybe even of today's generation as well. And as a teenager, presumably you went through bar mitzvah. You know, yeah, tell exactly. us about you know, that. You know, you know the whole story. So, <laughs> so I had my, I had my bar. Went to, we go to Heder Hebrew classes until the age of thirteen. And of course, um, people can go to Jewish schools where they can be, become more and more systematically ground in Jewish education and knowledge up until the end of the secondary school. But for most Jewish students where I lived, that never happened. You went to the synagogue school. Um, was it uh, Tuesday, Thursdays and Sundays and uh, we learned about Jewish tradition and it's where I trained to have my bar mitzvah and then I went on to have my bar mitzvah in Israel at the Western Wall and it was it was a, a lovely day. We and how a, significant was that for you? I think actually I think there's, there's always a great relief it was like I'd succeeded I'd, I'd passed I'd, I'd gone through this because it's kind of a really big event so maybe I was more relieved than thrilled but in terms of what it meant in terms of becoming a because the, the, the great miracle is at the age of 13 a, a Jewish boy ceases to be a boy and becomes a man but if you'd seen me at the age of 13 you weren't <laughs> going to be persuaded <laughs> so, um, I don't think I, I don't think I understood the, the gravity of that transition but also I don't think I was taught who God really really was about God's character and so I think that was missing. I can only look back now. I think then it was just, I'd, I'd done this. Um, I was really happy that I got through it. And it was lovely. It was, it was sensational. It was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to be in Israel and to have my bar mitzvah in Israel was, was, was fantastic. And why were, you, why were you there? Was it just a holiday or? Yeah, my parents, they decided because, because bar mitzvahs are so expensive that uh, she, my mum's a shrewd woman. She said, I can consolidate this into a four week holiday. <laughs> so, we did, we, so that's what we did. And we spoke to rabbis here and we arranged to have my bar mitzvah done out there. So it was done beautifully. Mm, yeah. Amazing. So if I'd met you, say, two or three, four years later and started talking with you and said, Ziggy, come on, what do you really believe about God? What, what would you have been saying? Oh, I would have said some very smart things, I'm sure. But no, um, I don't really know what I would have said. I would have said that the balance always was in the conversations we'd always had was, was God there? By the time you'd met me, let's say at the age as a teenager, late older teenager, I might have said I was more of an agnostic, more of an atheist because of the things we've been taught at school. But by the time I was at university, I would have then said, when I, especially when I was doing my PhD, I would have said, I could only reasonably be an agnostic purely because I'd need some kind of information I mean, otherwise, with, without having received any communication from God, I can say he's there or not, but I can't say whether he is or not. All I can say is I haven't heard from him. Huh, interesting. So the PhD, where was that and what was it I in? Did, I did that at Nottingham University. In? Oh, applied mathematics. Oh, right. I know. Okay. Yeah, Move yeah. on quickly. All right. <laughs> And your view of a Christian at this stage, you know, when you were doing your PhD, what, how would you have seen Christians? That's weird. We did have Christians <laughs> on the campus and they were awfully like lovely, strange people. Every Christian I really met, even when I was doing my master's degree, they were always a little bit too happy. And it wasn't particularly clear why they were so happy. It was like they were smoking something. That that is pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but they were they seemed to be kind and lovely, but definitely a little bit spaced out. I would have thought. <laughs> All right. Okay. So well, so we've got this journey so far. Now clearly, eventually, something began to change. What first of all triggered your thinking to consider Christian things? The only thing that, tr that triggered it was my friend who, at university. He wasn't Jewish or Christian. But a couple of years, he'd become a Christian after university. We were all, of all of his friends, we were like bemused. We couldn't kind of fathom why he would throw his life away with something ridiculous. It made no sense. But that only goes to show how naive we were. We didn't know what Christianity was. We just weren't particularly hot on it. But he became a Christian a couple of years after university and just invited me and some of his friends to hear a talk in the, in the church he was going to. And that's what I did. I think I had to go twice before I put my name down to do a short course called Christianity Explored. And um, and I did that. And we, week by week, we went, there was a little talk, maybe we opened the, the pages of the New Testament. We looked at 
one of the eyewitness accounts of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. It was Mark's gospel. And I had never, never done that. It only goes to show that however educated you think you are, if someone else is just opening a book with you, it makes it so much easier. And of course, we have questions, you know, what is going on? Why? Because there is so much. This is an ancient literature written about the most extraordinary man who ever lived. We're going to have questions. And there were wonderfully people around us who could begin, begin to answer my questions. But by the time I finished the course, I certainly wasn't ready to commit anything to Jesus. Right, now, I just want to go back a little bit. Your friend. So you were friends together at university. Uh -huh. He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what connected you with him? Just the fun loving people or what? Oh, uh, no, we lived, in the, we lived in the same hall of residence. I was a hall tutor, which meant I had the privilege of sitting with the warden and eating all the best food on the top table, <laughs> whereas I paid almost minimal rent. And, uh, and my particular, my, this particular friend lived two doors away from me in, in my block. I can look back and think it's amazing how God orchestrated. It's really funny because he's a juggler. And uh, I noticed some juggling balls. You know, when you get to meet the students for the first time, you try and create a bit of rapport. And I picked up some of his juggling balls and says, I can juggle, which was a joke because I could barely do it. And uh, if I'd looked a little bit more shrewdly around the room, then I would have seen the five clubs hanging on the wall <laughs> and the seven balls, you know. So no, he was, he was a professional juggler. <laughs> All right, okay. But you just hit it off together. You see, you, you got to know each other. Yes. And, and 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 then what did he at some stage just say, hey, I've become a Christian or were you discussing? Yeah, I've been away. In, I've been away in Russia for the year studying and I came back and he told me that he'd become a Christian. Amazing. And why were you in Russia studying this? Uh, You've had an interesting my, life. After my PhD, I did a postdoc in Russia with the Royal Academy. They gave me a very small amount of money, but it was enough <laughs> to be going for, for the year. Incredible. It was a good time. We did some, we did publish some work and I did, I did learn some, I, I often think about how I would write down and um, some of the unraveling some of the equations I was working on. And it was, uh, I had some beautiful experiences doing that in Russia. Yeah. And so you came back and then you found your, your good friend and become a Christian mm -hmm. and, and you and all your others felt he, he's weird. Why? Why was he so weird to have become a Christian? Maybe it's the way he went about it. I don't know. He just told us. Um, you asked a very penetrating question. Why did I think it was weird? Because in no, in no sense did my friend in any way seem like he was ever going to make that kind of decision. That, that didn't... I think maybe it was like we... Whatever we thought a Christian was, my friend wasn't like that. Ah, huh. Okay. He didn't fit into the, why would you, almost like, but why would you want to do that? What? You seem like a, a sincere chap. There's no reason for you to want to become a Christian. It makes no sense. I don't know anything about it, mind, but why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do something? The thing is, I think ultimately he just did something that was a little bit unusual. Mm. I suppose if someone said, I've decided I want to go and for friends said I want to go and join the army. <laughs> and we thought, well, we talk about where's this come from? Why would you, or, it, it, or if a friend said to you, I've decided to become a monk. You'd think, what are you talking about? It was a bit like that. Yeah. Okay. But he invited you to this church, St. Helen's Bishopsgate, which is right at the foot of the Gherkin in the heart of London, isn't it? It's an amazing church. But for you with a Jewish background, going into a Christian church. Was this the first time? What did you think? Were you fearful? What, what, what were your initial impressions? Yeah, before I do, I want to go back. I actually think it's a great thing to go in the army. Don't get me wrong. Don't <laughs> me. I was just simply saying that for, for someone who'd never shown any interest in going to the army, suddenly to do that. Obviously, yes, I understand we, that, we yeah. appreciate people really going to the army tremendously. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, I, um, I, uh, I was able to see beyond the church building because I was going to, to meet people to do this short course. Oh, um, and the reason I went, it could get into the church building in the first place is because my friend was with me. Therefore, mm -hmm. I didn't see a building. It's almost as if he was chatting to me and distracted me from where I was going, if, that, if that's helpful. But also, I did start to go to the Tuesday lunchtime talks at that particular church. And it works. I used to work nearby in the city. This is a very central uh, located it was, it was a church right next to the gherkin in the city in the financial district i used to go there on a tuesday lunchtime 
And because Tuesday lunchtime to a Jewish boy did not sound like church. <laughs> Interesting. Tuesday, what's that got to do with church? Mm. So you went there, you begin to hear talks and you did this course, as you say, which looks into Mark's gospel. Now, what was going through your mind? What questions were being raised? I think I came to the end of Mark 4 and I was just really amazed to see Jesus's authority, which would seem at the beginning of Mark's gospel, but he could command the waves. And we would look back at the Hebrew scriptures and see that only, only God himself has that kind of power. Hmm. Um, I was really impressed. And I, I did begin to think Jesus could be our promised Messiah. I really did. And I think ultimately it's because coming to a, love the person of Jesus, loving his power, loving his authority. Now, of course, Jesus is Jewish, you know, was, was that? I'm glad you know that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, was that appealing to you? Absolutely. Um, Jewish people love all things Jewish. Uh, and, uh, and uh, and so that, that should definitely include the Messiah. Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah, yes. either in various guises of a person, an era. Um, he's part of our heritage. And so when I came to see that Jesus could be a real candidate to be the Messiah, I was thrilled. I was thinking this could be it. This this If he is the one, I need to know that. Uh, mm. Because the, the Jewish, the hope of the Jewish nation is that the Messiah would come. Now, of course, in what we call the Old Testament, there are hundreds of prophecies describing the Messiah. Did, did, were you aware of these? I think to my shame, I think a lot of Jewish people are bound by, and I was the same, by tr certain traditions that meant we never opened the pages of the, of the Hebrew scriptures to look for them. I think there's a, there's a bit of, a sh a bit of a, 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 an overemphasis, maybe an entire emphasis on the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, there were 24 books in the, in, the, in, in, in the Hebrew reckoning of the Hebrew Bible. And so we would like focus on the first five and ignore the, the other 19. Mm -hmm. But actually, what we, as you, but as we begin to see, you begin to see a, a, a cumulative building on top of each other, revelation of the fact that God would one day send a savior, a messiah, a king into the world. And I didn't know that growing up as a Jewish man. Mm -hmm. But as I came to believe in Jesus and I was looking at the pages of the New Testament, the New Testament was telling me, go back and look at the Hebrew scriptures. Mm. It was telling me and it was telling me where to go. So I could look at places where there was like a Jeremiah 31 or Psalm 22 or an, even an Isaiah 53 and many more. I could begin to look back and begin to say, you know, it's a bit like comparing a finger with a fingerprint. And I'm, I'm saying the New Testament saying it's Jesus. And it's saying, go back and search the scriptures. And I can go look at the Hebrew scriptures. And I think, my goodness, it, it, it is him. It is him. Huh. I don't think God's ever played a game with us. God has always spoken clearly so that we can see. And if we have um, a desire to search for the Lord, then I think it's clear. It's clearly laid out, it's a clear roadmap. So we can see where the journey is going, where it ends. And when he gets to the end, he says, you can go back and look. This is where we were supposed to be. Shockingly, a Messiah who is crucified for our sins. Mm. Uh, now, of course, you can believe these things intellectually, Ziggy, but for a person to become a Christian, there needs to come that moment of commitment when they turn from their own way and trust the crucified, risen Jesus. Was that a difficult step for you? No, I think it was... It was e easy. Um, I've been away on, with the church for a weekend away. It was the first one I'd ever been on. Maybe I'd always, I'd always declined previously because I thought it was a bit too weird, but I, I went along. I just, I saw lots of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, um, people from different countries, different religions even, and they were coming together. So it was a mixed multitude, like the United Nations as it were. And they were coming together in this room, wanting to worship the, the God of Israel, through his son, the Messiah, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. I was really impressed and realized actually, it was like, this was what God spoke to Abraham about being a blessing to all of the nations, not, not just Israel, but all of the nations. I was really touched by that. And I think that weekend I went home and I prayed and uh, I had a very strong uh, experience. I had two strong emotions and one was joy, it was like a blinding light of joy as I recognized that the search was over, that Jesus was the one. But the other side of the coin, the other emotion 
was this incredibly overwhelming heaviness of fear because I realized for the very first moment in my life that I'd never honored God as my King, Creator and Sovereign Lord, that I'd never done that. And I experienced the fear of the Lord for the first time. I understood that I was a sinful person who was in God's presence. And this was a terrifying place to be. I often think, on one hand, I came to understand my, that I began all of a sudden it's like a shopping list of sins was suddenly presented before me as if this is why I was guilty of all of these things. And I think I had not thought about these things before, but now I realize that this was, this was terrible. Mm. Not only was it terrible to, to realize I was guilty before God, but I looked at the things that I had done that never bothered me before. And I was horrified that I had done those things. Mm. Been, been so implicit in these things. And then the thing that really troubled me even more than that wasn't just a shopping list of sins, the things that I'd done wrong before God, things which were just morally wrong. I was really horrified by my attitude. It's as if I was distancing myself from the shopping list, thinking I'm okay. And then I, then I realized I couldn't run because I had an attitude that really horrified me, an attitude of independence, an attitude where I wanted to live away from God, naturally wanted to live away from God, and saw how evil that was. And then I understood in that very moment that this is exactly how the Bible describes sin. Mm. And so I understood more than ever in that moment that I needed a savior. And I was delighted to receive Jesus as my Lord in that very moment because he was willing to save me, to rescue me, which is why he died on the cross. Because the thing that's between us and God is my sin. And God said, I will deal with it. And so I was, I was forgiven, not because of anything I had done or ever could have done, but because of what Jesus had done for me. Now, Ziggy, in, the, in your, you know, this uh, protracted time where you're thinking these things through, you're going to the course, etc. Did you talk with your parents? Did you talk to the rabbi mm -hmm. at all about what was going on in your mind? I definitely delayed on doing all of those things. And in, in the end, I, I spent a couple of years after I came to faith, delaying before telling my parents. Oh, really? I, I, first, I spoke to my brother and I asked him, "Was it? would it be a good idea to tell my parents? And he said, no. <laughs> then, uh, then I went away with my father for the weekend to, to tell him, um, knowing he would say, let me tell mum. And, uh, and he did. And I, I, I don't know whether it was wisdom or cowardice, but the reality is my mum was never going to respond well. Um, I don't know. I don't think all Jewish mums are the same, but I've only got one Jewish mum. <laughs> I knew this wasn't going to, I knew this wasn't going to go well. And um, it was going to be, if I'd known, if, I just, I just, I, I, I understood, I had a glimpse of the pain this would cause her. Mm. And I also knew that maybe I could soften the blow if I just got my dad to tell her. And what was her reaction? And it wasn't good. I mean, clearly it wasn't good. Um, I don't know how bad it was, but she certainly a couple of weeks later told me that you've you've done something strange, haven't you? And so she knew, she knew, she had it had been explained to her. I do I do regret it on some on some level because it must have been so hard for my father to receive it. He said he wasn't happy. He, he never expressed himself overtly emotionally, but he wasn't happy. And uh, but he did tell her. So I, I think he he. he he, he did a very honourable thing on my behalf. And, and, and in some sense, I gave both of them the opportunity to work through it without them, me, without them having to express anger directed towards me. They could have a time together to think about it huh. and to cope with it. Are they still alive? Yes, I hope so, because <laughs> I guess better uh, only the other day. <laughs> All right, well, then I was going to ask, you know, what's the relationship like now? And we have a very good relationship. Um, and occasionally if we to try and bring have a conversation that leans towards a, a something spiritual you know we can you can begin to feel maybe a little bit of resistance or maybe a little bit of willingness but um it's uh, it's not like i think we're always got to be struck by the fact that just because we're really excited about jesus we're excited that, that god loves us the reality is for many people we will meet that's not happening in their lives Mm. they're living perfectly happy satisfied lives with no knowledge of god and no need for god and just a general awareness that we're good people and there's sometimes there are bad things in the world um and thinking that just death is natural mm. and and nothing's going to shift them from that until we might say they they were to come to the 
to understand something more about Jesus. Because one thing Jesus does is he, he opens our eyes to who the Father is so we can know God. Um, can I ask about the rabbi? Did you speak with the rabbi? And my mum was pretty sure she did want me to see the rabbi, but it, but it never happened. And uh, I had gone to the synagogue in the year leading up to me coming to faith because I wanted to, to speak to some Jewish people about what they thought about some of these things in the Bible. But for the most part, I found that they were either not interested or, um, or, or, want, or they were actually not interested in the prophecies, but actually far more interested in other things. So it's very hard to have conversations directly with them. I want to talk a little bit more about that. But first, what difference did it make then that you, you became a Christian, you trusted Christ, you received forgiveness, new life. What, what, what sort of obvious differences were there about Ziggy Rogoff after this? I think I found great happiness and great joy. I had an understanding of, of where I was going. Of, of who I was. Um, existential reality, I don't know how people deal with it, and you can see how it really must affect people's mental, mental health. But as people come to Jesus and they can know that they are possessed by the Lord, they're loved by him, that they, they were made by him, that's got to really, really substantially transform people. For me, I used to have what were called night terrors as a child. And they even existed growing up into adulthood. And um, where I would wake up in, in the middle of the night and, and I didn't, and I would wake up and I didn't exist. It was really terrifying. Yes. <laughs> um, but when I came to understand who Jesus is, once I had a dream like that and I woke up in the middle of the night and God didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my entire identity had shifted away from me not existing to God not existing. Oh. Interesting. It's very, very, and I, I've never, ha I've never had any of those kind of dreams before. Mm. But actually, to know that my entire identity is built on him, and you know, some people might say we all need a crutch, but I think we we all need that kind of grounding. Yeah. To, to know where you've come from, where you're going, it means it, it takes off so much of the edge of the pressures of life, and also in day to day relationships. You know, we all have difficult relationships with people. We all have bosses and colleagues. We've all got people who really upset us. Mm. Family, for example. I mean, I have a perfect family, so. <laughs> but other families, I'm going to ask a little bit. <laughs> you can see, but actually, when you have a clear understanding that God loves all of those people around you, yeah. but actually, the, um, all of our hearts naturally are wired to the self. Uh, people are presenting their own agenda. They're, they're driven by fear. Um, we, we can have a radically new perception on life and, and love people in a way we've never loved them before. Mm. Um, now you're married. Did you marry, we, we call somebody, a Jewish person who's become a Christian, we call them Messianic Jews. Did you marry a Messianic Jew? No, no, I did, I did even better. I, I married a, a Romanian princess. So. <laughs> <laughs> really? You got a Romanian wife? Indeed. No, she was, uh, I met her, she came over from Romania to, as, a, as a school teacher. And after a couple of years, uh, she, because we do lots of evangelism, which means we just share the gospel with people on the street in a really loving, nice way. We come across as really normal people. And Christiana was part of my team. And uh, we found out we had a friend in common and we took it from there. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Do you mind me asking, um, with regard to Jewish people, there does seem a resistance, doesn't there, to really consider Jesus Christ? And it, it never quite, I never quite get my head around it, because to my, I don't know, very simplistic thinking, I, I would imagine Jewish people would be very interested in this Jewish person, Jesus, etc. Why is there this big barrier for them in their thinking? Um. Uh, simply put, we Jewish people would simply say it's not Jewish. Um, we'd also look at the persecution. I mean, Jewish people have been persecuted in the name of Jesus yeah. uh, by Christians, people who have adopted the name of Christians, or whether you call it Christendom. Um, you look at you look at Europe, which we would be perceived from a Jewish perspective as Christian, um, and and even even someone like Hitler would, in his early life, profess to be. A Christian and those kind of things I think have made it so very very difficult Jewish people have been persecuted not just in not just 
in the name of Jesus during the Holocaust, uh, but throughout many generations. And anti-Semitism was, was live and kicking after the war in England as well. Yeah, uh, it's still becoming an issue today again. Yeah, and so I just think Jewish people uh, conflate the idea of being a Gentile with being a Christian, with being an anti-Semite. So I don't want to overly push that point, but um, there's a, it creates for them and us. Mm. Mm. And the only the way that most Jewish people have come to hear the gospel is maybe in those more tender times of life, maybe when they're at university. Mm. They might come from a particularly liberal background, and and they've just come to recognise this. There's a gap in their knowledge; they didn't know something about Jesus, mm. maybe something about the, the the college at the university they're at. And if they before you know, they're beginning to find out who Jesus is, and they're discovering a Jesus they never could have imagined. And if yeah. I was Jewish and talking to you and say, Ziggy, why should I become a Christian? What would you say? I say, well, first of all, I would tell you not to become a Christian. <laughs> all right, go on. And because the word Christian it contains so much jargon. Right. Uh, I would call myself a Jewish believer in Jesus. Okay. It's simpler. I'm a Jewish man who has come to recognize that our scriptures speak about the Jewish man, Jesus. Um. The word Christian has so much ne so much negative baggage, so much negative connotations, and uh, therefore I would uh, I would always recommend never to say I, I spoke to my friend Ziggy who became a Christian, to say my friend Ziggy who is a Jewish man who believes in Jesus. Huh. It's clearer uh, and maybe more provocative as well. More, uh, it's certainly um, more confrontational in a sense, but but it means this Jewish man has done something with his knowledge of Jesus. Whereas the word Christian, we don't know what that necessarily means to anybody. But to uh, answer your question, mm. why would it, I want any Jewish person to come to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah? It's because he really is telling us the truth. This isn't a matter even of faith. This isn't even a matter of morality or religion. It's just a matter of truth. Is Jesus telling us the truth when he says that he is the Messiah? And then we have to, if you take it further, we go back and think, do we think the gospel writers, the Jewish men who wrote the New Testament, we see that Luke uh, probably wasn't Jewish, but all of the gospel writers in the, in, in the New Testament are Jewish writers. And we would say that they have come to trust and to love Jesus. They trust him. And so today you can pick up any eyewitness account of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus written by people who sincerely believe that Jesus was really telling them the truth. And this is a truth that really matters because he's telling us we can actually have a relationship with God, that we need our sins to actually be forgiven. Because God won't stand around and let sin go on forever. There will be a day of judgment. And I think any person who thinks that God might exist must automatically be thinking there's a day of reckoning. It just somehow feels right within our souls and that's exactly what the, the hebrew bible and the new testament says that jesus has come to save us and rescue us from that day of judgment so that we can become his children mm. it's a matter of trust and if you trust him well then you put your faith in it amazing just quickly time's gone ziggy this jews for jesus just tell us again what exactly is it what does it do well it says what it does. Um, we're Jewish people. <laughs> it's on the can, yes. I want to explain to someone, we're Jewish people who share the gospel with all people, including other Jewish people. And, and the woman who asked me this question said, I don't like smart asses, but that's all we do. We're Jewish people and we believe in Jesus. And out of a sheer love of our people, we just want to tell them that Jesus has come and he is ours. Hmm. He's come for us. He's come to rescue us. Of all the people in the world, Jesus came for the Jewish people first. They have, we had the greatest need. We were the ones who were waiting for him. And such is God's, God's abundant love. He wouldn't just stop, as it says in Isaiah 49, 6, 40, chapter 49, verse 6, speaking about how it wouldn't be enough that God would just come for his Jewish people. God would come for all of the nations. Mm. So every nation in the whole world has a great need and is greatly loved by God. And that's why Jesus came, so we can be, be forgiven. Jesus, what's, Jesus. The web, what's the website? Um, you can get the Jews for Jesus. It's F-O-R-J-E-S-U-S, F-O-R, no, J-E-W-S, F-O-R, J-E-S-U-S, dot org dot UK. org dot UK, okay. Or you can, I mean, if you want to, you can personally email me, and my name is Ziggy, Z-I-G-G-Y, at Jews for Jesus dot org. Okay.
that's great. Well, now, um, Ziggy, we hope we'll be able to chat and ask you some more questions later on, but they won't be nice, gentle ones from me. They could be from all sorts of folk. But <laughs> Ziggy, we're really grateful to you. And, um, uh, well, yeah, God bless you, your good wife, Noah, and who knows, possibly Roger. You never know. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that one, Roger. Yeah, <laughs>